Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 15 in our ongoing series in Middle Egyptian and Hieroglyphics. This time we'll be going over the story of the shipwreck sailor. The story of the shipwreck sailor, sometimes you'll see it as the tale of the shipwreck sailor, um, I think really it doesn't matter that much, is one of the only complete Egyptian narrative works. Uh, a lot of the texts we get from Egypt are either religious texts or their royal proclamations or their tomb biographies. We get a lot of those. We also have a decent number of like the sort of things that we would today lump in as nonfiction, you know, medical texts and that kind of thing. Uh, we have a few mathematical papyri, but we only have a few prose narratives. And this is one of the very, very few that is complete. I think it may be the only one that is complete on a single papyrus. Uh, it was, if I remember correctly, it was on the back of like a shipping label, basically. Like the front part was some import and export records for a port, and on the back was this story. Uh, it was written in the Middle Kingdom. The copy we have is from the New Kingdom. Um, by that time, it had become kind of a scribal exercise to practice writing. That's probably why it was found on basically scrap paper. Uh, it, it is one of the best examples of the literature of the Middle Kingdom, which is why it survived so long. And it is also an excellent learning tool. Uh, it is a story that is kind of long, but easy to break into segments. It has a lot of grammatical variety. It has an interesting narrative, so you kind of stay with it. But it also has a narrative that's vaguely predictable enough that you know where it's going. You're not. You're going to kind of catch yourself if you find yourself translating some nonsense. Now, I will admit that the story is kind of weird. It's a fairy tale, really. But at the end of the day, you, you'll kind of know if you've gotten something badly wrong. It's the, the plot is logical, at the very least, in its own uh, mythical universe. Today, we will specifically be going over the first 13 lines of the story. This is not a decision I made arbitrarily. This is the part that's an example given by Hoke in Chapter 8. As you know, my policy is not to go over anything that Hoke does not give you the answer to. This is partially to prevent me from steering you wrong, as I am no expert, but it is also so that you cannot use my videos to cheat on your homework. I hope that there are people who watch my videos who are in classes learning Egyptian and are watching these to study as an addition to their own notes, and I don't want you to use it to cheat on your homework. I care much too much about academic integrity for that. So instead of going over one of the parts that he has left as a potential homework exercise that you were assigned, one that I think you should be assigned, if you know, if I were your professor, I would assign it to you, and if you're learning it on your own, you should assign it to yourself to do, we will be doing the ones that Hope gives, but we'll doing it, we will be doing it in more detail with more explanation. Now, we compared to our usual example sentences, I'm not going to put quite as much information on the screen because these sentences are shorter and it does and I will just talk over the the visuals um, about the grammar a bit more. I'm not going to like not go over what the form of the verb is. Actually, it's going to be a lot of the focus here, but I am going to do a little less of that. The usual example sentences are going to happen for chapters seven and eight, as I promised. Those will be in the next lecture. I just wanted to do this first because, quite frankly, it's a more fun video to make. Um, and because it illustrates a decent number of the same principles. I do not believe there are any perspectives here, but I know there are plenty of statives, um, and there are even some good infinitives and some sedgmuous passives and all, all manner of good things. So, without further ado, let's get started with our opening sentence. In transcription, Jed in Shemesh Iker. Jed should be immediately recognizable. That's our verb. It means to speak. Uh, in is a particle that we haven't learned yet. This is one of the things that Hoke makes a note of because you haven't learned it, so he's just going to tell you. Uh, it is a narrative form that kind of indicates sequence. So you can just kind of translate in as then. Uh, so the, in the general, it's sejem in f is the form. So you're expecting your verb, jed, and then the in particle, and then the subject of the verb, shemesh. Uh, Shemesh, Hulk gives it as retainer. That's how he's going to translate it. So, Jed in Shemeshu Iker. And it is Shemeshu, I forgot the W in my own transcription. 
jedin altogether is the verb form uh, with the subject noun shemesh. Uh, and then iker at the end is just an adjective modifying the noun. As we'd expect, it follows the noun that it modifies. Nothing terribly complicated here. Uh, so that gives a pretty basic translation. Jedin then said shemesh is a retainer. Iker means trusty, you know, trustworthy, honest, etc. So then the trusty retainer said, I put in a comma where Hoke didn't, but the translation here is pretty trivial. Other than wiggling around synonyms, there isn't a lot you can do. Then on to the next sentence, and this one is a little more grammatically interesting because our first, first of all, there is going to be an idiom, and the second of all, there is an adjective verb. Gweja means cheerful, but we're leading with an adjective, which is kind of weird. You wouldn't usually start a sentence with an adjective. You'd usually start a sentence with either you plus a noun or with a verb, and that's exactly what we have. We have a verb happening because it's immediately followed by a noun. So what we would anticipate is a verb. But the, yeah, if it's followed by a noun, the first thing is almost certainly a verb. Let's write down our transcription of weja ibek hatia. And then our parsing is, yep, it's a verb, and then a noun with an attached suffix pronoun, weja ibek, and then another noun, hatia. Now this is, this, is a bit odd grammatically. It's an idiom. Um, effectively, hatia is the object of the verb, uh, but that would be a weird thing to translate. Literally, weja ibek means ma make your heart cheerful. It's an imperative, something we haven't really learned, so I'm not going to go over in detail how that works. Suffice to say, make your heart cheerful. And then taking that whole thing effectively as a single verb phrase of sorts, we can just say, make your heart cheerful. Uh, Hoke translates governor, but I prefer lord because governor, <laughs> yes, Hatia, the hereditary princes are governors, but to say it literally makes you sound like you're speaking in like a bad imitation British accent. So I prefer lord because that's how you would address someone who was noble and above you. Or perhaps captain works here too. Cheer up captain would be fine. Uh, but Hatia is a little more literally taken as lord. Right, and in our next sentence, uh, we start off with mech. You should all recognize that as our introductory particle. Mech, pek, enen, henenu. That's our transcription. So mech means we're, we are definitely starting a new sentence. Um, or it could be circumstantial to the previous, but it would be kind of odd to continue the sentence there. And there's another verb and all that. Where it makes the most sense to take this as a new sentence, a new thought. Mek pekanen. Well, we have a whole word because you have the word pek and then a determinative after. So that should be the end of the word, followed by an n, followed by another n with three lines. Should be pretty clear what's going on there. The, our verb is pech, and that is a, a verb. You could look it up. But even if you didn't know that pech, what pech was exactly, the fact that it's followed by an N and then another N with lines under it, especially in a context where two people are conversing, where you might expect a first-person plural describing something that's true of both of them, and knowing that N with three lines under it is the first-person plural, you can pretty confidently say that this is a sejim NF form of the verb in the first person plural, pek and n. And that would, in fact, be a correct assumption. Pech means to arrive. Pech and n means we have arrived. And then henu, kind of a common word. It means home. So look, we've arrived home. We've come home, however you want to translate that. Yeah, perhaps thinking about it now, um, saying reached home or arrived home makes home a noun. Saying come home makes home 
an adverb, and hanu is definitely doing a noun thing here. It's definitely the object of the verb of arrive or reach. All right, and this is our next sentence. Um, these words may be kind of unfamiliar at this point. I don't think there's there, either of them are terribly common. Um, actually, that's going to be the pattern for the next couple of sentences. We're going to get a whole description of the current situation, and we're going to get it in the form of words that are not really in particularly common use. Our transcription here is shesep herpu, two words. Now, what's interesting here is there's no N, even though in the previous circumstantial there was. And what's also of note is that there's only one noun here before we hit our next verb in the next sentence or phrase, really. But if you look at the translations of the words, shesep means to take up, and herpu means mallet. Now, mallet can't be the subject of take up. That would be patent nonsense. A mallet can't take anything up. It's a hunk of wood. So there must be something missing here, and there is. And that something missing is a W, which explains why there isn't an N, even though that's some, this is something that is happening, as we'll see when we translate, it's something that happens logically before you reach home. It's the thing that's, you know, basically, to spoil what's happening, the next couple of sentences are going to describe what happens as the ship is pulling into the dock. That's all stuff you have to do before you can disembark and say you've gotten home and all that. So this is all in the logical past of the thing that the circumstantial is. It's all stuff that has happened. But there's no N, which means that this is a passive. There's no W, because the Egyptians rarely wrote the W for their passive, but here we have a clear-cut Sejimu F passive past tense. Seshep herpu, the mallet having been taken up. No, nobody knows who's taking it up. Presumably some of the sailors or whatever. We have taken up the mallet, but that's not what they're saying. They're not saying shesep nn herpu. It's just seshep herpu, the mallet having been taken up. Here, another similar situation. Our word is huwu minit. Just two words. Who is a verb. It means to drive. Um, you can see several images of people hitting things. That's what's happening. You're driving something into the ground. Uh, and a minit is a mooring post. Again, a mooring post cannot drive. It can only be driven, which means that we are dealing with another passive verb. The mooring post having been driven in. And then another thing that happens when you reach land on a ship. Hatat rediti kherta. Now, this is interesting because hatat is not actually the verb. Hatat is not exactly a common word, so I will forgive you for not knowing it. But what it means is mooring post. Or no, not mooring post, sorry, is the, the bow warp, um, the, the front part, or the bow warp, the front part of the ship. Uh, the other three words you will probably recognize. Redi is to place, ker is upon, and ta is land. So even if you didn't know what khatat was, something is being put on land, so you could just kind of assume the front part of the ship. Because, you know, if you're taking coming home, you're setting your boat back up on the shore, uh, you would drag it back onto the land or onto whatever, you know, presumably the Egyptians were like dry docking their ships, I guess, putting them, putting them on land when they were done with them. But in any case, you will note that khatat comes first. And you will also note that there's a T at the end of her D, but there's, it couldn't really be like a feminine suffix pronoun. That would be kind of weird. There's uh there's no like prior she for it to refer to, and 
there would also be no object of that verb. It would be a very confusing phrase, so it cannot be that. Instead, that T must be part of T-I-T. Riditi would be the full expression of the stative form, the feminine sing third person singular stative, which refers back to and agrees with in gender and number hatat. Riditi means to put or place, which means that the hatat must be the thing being put or placed, herta, on land. The bow warp having been placed on land. And then yet another thing needs to happen before the boat can get off. Not something we really do anymore. Red hechnu. Red here is shortened form of redi. The reason it is red and not redi is because we are once again dealing with a passive. Hechnu is a noun. It's not really red, that's what's written, but it's redu. Redu hechnu. Passive verb with a noun. We've already seen a couple of these, so I can go over it in as much detail. Hechnu means praise. Redi. In this case, we translate it as give. The Egyptians are saying they're like putting praise forward. Praise having been given. That's just the Egyptian idiom. Now, something a little odd, because the Rudi governs the next phrase as well, but Hoke writes it as a separate line. Dua necher. This one, um, I think it's it's kind of odd how Hoke writes it. He has like a hyphen in it. Um, yeah, actually, no, this this one Rudy does not govern. Uh, dua do, is also a verb. Um, dua meaning to thank or really to praise according to the Concise Dictionary of Middle Egyptian. There's a bit of disagreement between that book on Hoke on what exactly this means and how precisely this should be translated. In any case, another sejimu of passive form, meaning the gods having been praised. Nature is the gods, dua is praised, so the gods have been praised. So we have taken care of all of our responsibilities, landing a ship, and what do we do when we're all excited to come home when we've taken care of any, everything? Sa neb cher hepet senu f. Here we have an ongoing cher plus infinitive, cher hepet, which is placed into a regular noun plus adverbial comment sentence. And it works exactly how we would anticipate it would. So we start, we have sa neb. Pretty simple. Sa, very basic noun. Learned it in chapter one, it means man. Neb means every, it's an adjective. So it's every man, cher chepet. An infinitive phrase with cher. Uh, implies ongoing action. We know we should put it in the past tense because everything else has been in the past tense. So that it wouldn't make sense for this to be going on in the present. It's a circumstantial clause. So it must be contemporaneous with the original circumstantial. Remember that if you wanted something in the relative past of the circumstantial, there's a different way of phrasing it. Uh, which I believe is covered in our video on statives. There's like a, a different phrasing that conveys that same sense. If, if memory serves, it is the stative plus chafet. I don't remember it well because it's not terribly common. And then we have something that I hope you'll remember is possible. The imply, uh, the implied subject, or the implied object, of the infinitive verb, senu f. So 
So hepet means to embrace. Her hepet was embracing. Logically, you need an object for the verb embracing, and that is provided with senu. Senu f specifically. So every man was embracing senu f his companion. Every man, it should be was, not is. Every man was embracing his companion. I like, I did not put it in, but I do particularly like Hoke's use of while because that, that really gets across that this is happening. You know, we've landed safely. We did all the stuff we needed to land. So we landed safely while everyone was celebrating the fact that we landed safely, you know, by hugging each other, high-fiving, you know, all that. And then we get a little bit of redundancy. Isut ten iit adate. Isut is true, um, not a super common word. Um, the extra the, the extra t there, Hoke had it in parentheses, but I think it is correct in its writing. If it's just the n, then it's our crew. If it's 10, it's your crew. The fact that it was written like that makes me think that it was meant to be your crew, that it was supposed to be um, possessed by the, the captain, the hatia, the lord, whatever. Isut ten, your crew, eat. Now again, here's a verb with a T after it following a feminine noun. Hmm, probably a stative. And you would be correct in thinking that. And then finally, Ad, adet, us, which is here taken as safely. I think considering the T at the end, um, this is supposed to also be another stative, modif acting as an adverb and modifying the arrival itself. So you're, we can just take the whole thing. Yes, as your crew either <laughs> your crew has arrived and is safe, or your crew has arrived safely in safety. Uh, odd being the verb meaning to be safe. I think it's actually probably just an adjective verb. And then that T ending gives away that we are dealing with a stative. And also it's positioning in the sentence. If we, we wanted to say your crew, your safe crew has arrived, it would precede the e eat. All right, and then a bit of a longer sentence. Now that we have finished dealing with all of that, we get another mech signifying the beginning of another thought. Mech ref and eeween m chetep. Uh, that whether this is in or eeween is apparently a little unclear, but the meaning doesn't change at all. So we'll just treat it as the ween because that is a thing that we learned. Mech, of course, we know. Uh, ref then is now. N, of course, is a, a suffix pronoun, which we've appended to that. Um, and then ee ween is a stative in the first person plural that agrees with the object. We just saw ee, it means arrive. So it's agreeing with their, our suffix pronoun of we, of n. So we have arrived, m chetep, in safety. Pretty simple. Now, that's supposed to be a pronoun, not a preposition, but now look, we have returned in safety. Ta'en pechenen su. Here is an example of something called topic fronting. 
This will see ta and not ta nu. That was a, a typo on my part that I missed before. So, in topic fronting, you take the most interesting part of your sentence, the most important part, and put it at the front. Also, my apologies for that pop-up. Uh, my computer does that sometimes. No way of controlling it. So, any, regardless. You take the most interesting part of your sentence, put it at the front, and in this case, that's the land. They're very excited to see their land. So, of course, the most interesting part is ta en, our land. Then we have, as written, it's pef en, but there's supposed to be, there would be another en properly. Um, it was not written, probably because there was already an n there, and they didn't, and the scribe did not feel like it. It may simply have been a scribal error, but we know the meaning anyway. Pef en en. Uh, we saw this earlier. It means we have reached, and it's a circumstantial, but the topic is being fronted, so we're allowed to kind of cheat a little. And then su is it. So instead of, in quote unquote proper grammar, if we were to you know, follow all of, our, all of our rules, it would be pek en en ta en. We have reached our land, but instead we're fronting the topic. And so we must say our land, we have reached it. You know, a, a little more um, excitement about the land. Then we have Sejim Rek Eni Hatia. This one is a little bit simpler. Sejim is our verb with which we are familiar uh, to hear. Any to me Hatia is our, you know, our form of address, Lord. Uh, rec, I believe, is, in, is the adverb modifying Sejim, you know, the, the now listen to me, adding a, adding a bit of force to the request, effectively. Now listen to me, Lord. And then our final sentence, inek shu hau. Inek is our independent pronoun. Shu is a verb meaning to be trustworthy and, or meaning to be free, and hau is exaggeration. So we get, I am one who is free of exaggeration. And this is a rare use of the independent pronoun. Remember, that's used to make a forceful statement of sorts. Uh, and in this case, he's really trying to emphasize his own lack of lying. That he is, because of the story he's about to tell, he is correctly assessed, sounds ridiculous on the face of it. And he really wants to get across, I am one uh, who is free of exaggeration. No uncertain terms. All right. So that is all that we have. Um, there is more standard example sentences kind of down the pipe in the next lecture. Uh, but I do hope this is helpful in your understanding of this lesson. Please let me know if you have any questions. I know I didn't like dive into all of the sentences in full, so please feel free to post any questions you still have in the comments.